I would like to welcome you to the global webinar on the impact of COVID-19 on the global economy, future of healthcare, education, energy, and employment, challenges and opportunities. Today is Friday, July 17, and we are going live now, 6.30 p.m. IST, 2 p.m. GMT, 3 p.m. CET, and 9 a.m. US time. If you are still not registered, please visit uh, www.leadindia.us and register so that you can get a certificate. And we are live on leadindia.us as well as facebook.com, hari.ipanapali. Please log in. So I'm going to take you a brief introduction about today's webinar. on impact of COVID-19 on the global economy, future of healthcare, education, energy, and employment, the challenges and opportunity. And my name is Hari Panapli. I'm the chairman of the Lead India Foundation. So let me just share a few items about uh, the Lead India. Lead India is a brainchild of Dr. Kalam Vision 2020 and founded with a mission to provide affordable quality healthcare, affordable quality education, preserve and protect this planet for future generations, and also develop spiritual families to establish peace and harmony in the society. Lead India also conducts value-based leadership training programs to transform youth into responsible citizens and engage them in developing the nation. Dr. Kalam is the former president of India. He's the chief mentor for Lead India movement, and he is a great scientist and visionary and he's well known uh, for his contributions to the space technology, the missile technology. And more than that, he was the people's president of India and he was the 11th president of India. And the Financial Policy Council is our co-host today. It started with a mission to formulate and promote sound public policy based on the principles of free enterprise and wealth creation as envisioned by the ideals of the American founding fathers. FPC is a public policy oriented organization which seeks to educate and inform the public about economic and fiscal matters. One second. And I would like to welcome today's chief guest, Honorable Dr. Harshavardhan. He is the chairperson for Executive Board World Health Organization, and he is also a Minister of Health and Family Welfare, Minister of Science and Technology and Minister of Earth Sciences for the Government of India. Welcome, Dr. Harshwardhan. Thank you for joining us today. And I would like to introduce our keynote speakers today. Myself, uh, Hari Panapali, I'm um, giving you the welcome address. And our inaugural keynote speaker is Ziad Abdul Noor, Chairman of the Financial Policy Council and also CEO of Blockhawk Partners. Our keynote speaker is Prime Minister, Dr. Louis George Stin the state of African diaspora, and he's also honorary president of CRAN, France. He's joining us from Paris today. And our valedictory keynote speaker is Brian Patrick Lewing. He's the chairman of Reifenberg One Hutstein Limited. He is joining us from Netherlands today. So our distinguished guest speakers, Vibhav Kant Upadhyaya, Chairman of Alternate Development Organization based in Oslo, Norway. He is also Chairman of the India Center. He's joining us from Tokyo today. Professor Manuel Freire Garabal is the Professor of University of Santiago. He is joining us from Spain today. And we have Natalia Sakalova, co-founder and CEO of SDG World, a family office based in California. And I have uh, Eduardo Herto. Mercado he is joining us from Peru. He is an international consultant for the World Bank. And we have Himanshu Patel, founder and CEO of Triton Electric Vehicles and also Triton Solar. He is joining us from New Jersey, USA today. And we have our um, MC's young uh, Madhuri Gujay. She is an event manager for today's program. She has a BN political economy. 
graduated from University of California, Berkeley. And I have uh, Samir Ipanapali, a 10th grade student from Bakersfield, California. He's the founder of successview.org. And we have Vaishnavi Chipa, a ninth grade student from Fremont, Fremont California. So we have several uh, organizations and media partners. So we have Mana TV, TV5, who are broadcasting live today. And also we have uh, TV Asia broadcasting live today. And we have uh, Navatelgu uh, TV channel also broadcasting live today. And we have uh, the CIC group, the Al Khalifa Business School, Alternate Development Organization, Digithan, Triton Electric Vehicles, Young Leaders of Telangana, and Environment Organization, SDG, and NRI Wala. In addition to that, we have several organizations, media partners, TV Asia, GNN, NRI Radio, GKTV, Janam Sakshi, Radio Aid, Free Press, Navateja, Voice Today, V5, Top Telugu, and BCN News. So let me just share a few thoughts about uh, what is happening in today's um, impacted COVID world. So I just captured some numbers uh, as of uh, 4 a.m. GMT. We have um, the world numbers about 13 point, almost 14 million people affected, close to 592,000 people succumbed to death. And just in the USA, we have 3.6 million people, 141,000 people dead. In Brazil, which is the number two position, were 2 million people and 76,000 people dead. India reached number three position. We have over 1 million people impacted and 25,000 people suffering <clears throat> from coronavirus. It's a very sad situation and we have to do something about it. So just to run through a few quick uh, points that I summarized here. The projected cost of COVID-19 is about $80 to trillion over the next five years. And COVID-19 will hit hardest cities of developing countries. Two out of every five jobs lost may not come back. Inequality gap widens in the society because of this. Reduced liquidity in the marketplace and increased borrowing costs. From a technology point of view, a healthier digital lifestyle is a plus. Uh, regulatory barriers will fall, that is also a plus. A boon to virtual reality, an opportunity for innovation, result in stronger domestic supply chains, because we have seen all the problems uh, getting things from different parts of the world which never reached us on time. Increased e-commerce and online shopping. From a health and education point of view, we will have rise in use of telemedicine, rise in virtual online education, and governments definitely now playing the role of big pharma now, supplying all the medications, especially India providing hydroxychloroquine to all the world uh, countries. Science reigns in again, we need a lot of research and innovation. And virtual assemblies, parliaments and congress sessions is going to be a norm looks like. Big governments make a comeback. Inequality gap widens in the society, lead to political uprising. Electronic voting and voting by mail could be a norm now. Revived trust in institutions and online transactions are in rise. From a lifestyle point of view, virtual office, virtual education will be a reality. Less communal dialing, dining parties and places of worships will be minimum. Big impact on active life and health, so we need to pay attention to that. Improved environment, clean air and clean water, this is a big plus. So the, I'll, I'll summarize the, the problem for today's webinar. COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the global economy, healthcare, education, energy, and employment due to restricted. This created an opportunity and an undeniable challenge like reduced productivity, increased unemployment, and reduced liquidity in the market. This may require partnerships between institutions of developed and developing countries to share knowledge and resource to kickstart economy using the green energy and industry 4.0 technologies to generate more employment, offer affordable quality healthcare and affordable quality education through blended learning and so that this can scale throughout the world. So some of the issues with the economy in 2020, forecasts of global economic growth are down 
from around 3% to 2.4%. China will be the only large economy that is predicted to grow 1.2% by the end of the year. It took 15 days for the US economy to drop 20% in April, which is considered to be one of the fastest decline ever. This is due to large part of economic activity being shut down in the US. In the healthcare side, patients going in for basic ambulatory care decreased by almost 60% in April and telehealth visits increased. Issues with lack of testing and PPE supply, which has highlighted global supply chain problems. COVID-19 has disproportionately affected minority and low income communities in the US, highlighting the need for equal access to affordable healthcare and focus on the social determinants of health. There are about 25 companies trying to create a vaccine and are currently testing it. Hope to see that vaccine come very soon. And from education point of view, shift of education instruction to a completely virtual environment has created structural disadvantages and developing countries and has joined, has jeopardized hands-on learning for students studying engineering masters, a medical <laughs> education Online learning also has increased access to affordable and high quality education to all opportunity for cross-cultural learning, resource sharing between universities and the world, opportunity for partnerships among developed and developing countries, institutions, using online learning tools to upskill and reskill low-skilled workers to prepare them for the industry 4.0 requirement. Energy areas with lockdown in place saw 50 to 75% reduced road transportation. Global oil demand dropped by 5%. Electricity increased by 20% because people are staying home and using ACs and other appliances. Carbon emissions are expected to drop by 8%, creating a short-term positive impact on air quality in major global cities. The demand for coal industry is estimated to drop around 8%. And the employment point of view, just in the US, about 20.6 pe million people are unemployed, about 14.7% in the US. And Federal Reserve believes it could reach to 47 million, about 30% unemployment rate. And the same thing is expected around the globe. The coronavirus outbreak is expected to wipe out about 6.7% of the working hours, which affects around 195 million jobs across the world. We will see the inequality gap widen as unemployment increases and college graduates are left jobless. So my request to speakers in light of the coronavirus, we now understand that the ecological balance is maintained when human activity is reduced. So how can we rebuild our economic structures to more environmentally sustainable? So my favorite uh, subjects to revive the economy and also use the technology to the fullest I suggest to use artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, genetic testing, 5G technology, augmented and virtual reality. Cybersecurity is a need because of the increase in online access, autonomous and electric vehicles. Smart cities is the way to go to address these are some of the problems we are facing today. And where the opportunities are, highlighting the importance of technology proficiency in an increased digitized world increase in access to affordable and high quality education through online learning, opportunity for cross-cultural learning and resource sharing between universities around the world, opportunity for partnerships among developed and developing countries, institutions, using online learning tools to upskill and reskill low-skill workers to prepare for Industry 4.0. And I request a call for action today through all these speakers and also participants of this webinar globally. I would like to request you to provide recommendations to governments and academic institutions to conceive and implement policies to offer affordable quality healthcare and education at scale, maximize the utilization of technology to connect developed and developing countries. I request all the eminent speakers of this global webinar to propose solutions so that the governments can act fast in deregulating and take steps to stimulate the economy and we will create a task force out of this webinar to create to draft the proceedings and submit to various governments and relevant institutions to consider and implement the recommendations. Thank you very much. And I would like to introduce now our chief guest, Dr. Harshavardhan. <clears throat> Thank you. 
I would like to welcome our chief guest, Dr. Harshvardhan. He is the chairperson of Executive Board, World Health Organization, Minister of Health and Family Welfare, Minister of Science and Technology, and Minister of Earth Sciences, Government of India. Dr. Harshvardhan's public life has been marked outstanding achievements in the fields of health, education, law, science, and technology, and environment. As India's health minister. His proactive handling of the ongoing COVID-19 crisis has helped India to minimize the spread of the pandemic. Earlier in his life, his countrywide campaign helped to wipe out polio from the face of India. He was also at the forefront of the battle against tobacco and drug abuse. Dr. Harshvardhan was instrumental in the enactment of several laws, including the Delhi prohibition of smoking in public places and non-smoking Health Protection Act. As a result, the Supreme Court of India directed all states to replicate this law. Dr. Harshvardhan implemented the National Drug Policy, which was recognized by the World Health Organization as the Delhi model. This model was adopted and implemented by many other countries. I would like to invite Dr. Harshvardhan to address this August gathering. We look forward to your direction in terms of what the World Health Organization is planning to do, as well as what you're planning to do to prevent the spread of COVID-19, especially in India, which has reached number three. Welcome, sir. Look forward to your inaugural address. Thank you, Dr. Hari. Uh, Good evening, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> I know I am joined by very distinguished people from all parts of the globe at this particular moment. And I would like to thank you, Dr. Hari, the chairman of the Lead India Foundation for organizing this event today and for also giving me the privilege of being amongst uh, so many distinguished people all across the world. I know and I acknowledge and convey my greetings to all the distinguished speakers. Mr. Ziad Abdul Noor, the chairman of the Financial Policy Council, Prime Minister Dr. Louis George Stin, Shri Brian Patrick Leoning, Shri Vibhav Kant Upadhyay, Dr. Manuel Freire Garebel, Ms. Natalia Sokolova, Eduardo Huarta Mercado, Himanshu B. Patel, and all other distinguished people who have joined this webinar today from many parts of the world. Dr. Hari, it's a great privilege for me to be amongst all of you. I have known your activities for many, many years. And I know you left India four decades back, roughly four decades back. And in 2008, under the guidance and inspiration of our very dear visionary leader and scientist of India, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalamji, who was loved and adored by every Indian whom we all miss even today, is the one who inspired you to start this Lead India Foundation. And uh, being his brainchild, I always feel grateful that you have been carrying forward, forward his vision in a very, very dynamic manner and spreading it not only across US, but all across the world. I know that the vision of this organization is focused on ensuring that there is affordable health care for all the people. There is affordable quality health care and quality education for everyone. And the whole world learns 
to stop insulting the planet and in a way learns to contribute to preserve and protect the planet and you have also in your vision the aim of having spiritual families where there is better harmony amongst the family members and of course motivating younger generation for value based activities in their life when i was trying to look at these five points which are the broad visions of the lead india foundation and when i was trying to learn from what you just now projected about the post covid world also and what's happening right now although covid has disturbed everybody's life today it we have already paid a huge amount of cost for this huge loss you mentioned about the lives lost and the morbidities all over the world that it has produced and the disturbance in all sectors including economy that it has caused and the debacle that it has produced for the economy but even after that i was just trying to analyze that somehow it has brought about a change for the whole world which you very rightly and very nicely and in very great detail elaborated that in the long run it is going to improve definitely the quality of health care it is going to bring about a great amount of more focused and better attention on health care delivery systems of the whole world by the politicians and the administrators and of course the delivery of education will become more modern and more scientific and more cost effective and useful for the people and we have i think learned from covid that probably we need to respect nature in a much more dignified manner with much more sincerity and commitment much more honesty and piousness and that's what the people have started learning lockdown all over the world in different forms have somehow forced people to live at home to spend more time with their families to take better care of their elders and their children and of course many people have learned to dedicate more of their time towards yoga and meditation and all this also for the post covid world has laid a strong foundation for what you has have been putting as one of your vision to have spiritual families the fifth part of your vision about motivating the youth for value based activities i think that you are already pursuing and i am sure that in spite of the fact that we have paid a huge amount of cost for handling covid or mitigating the menace of covid we should see a better world in the future times and all of us all across the world have to look at it 
from that perspective only i know that i have been i had been regularly saying that we may have to wait for the vaccine we may have to wait for the appropriate drugs but the big social vaccine is always with us because protecting yourself from covid was not a big rocket science that we all had to practice it was just about few things wearing a mask maintaining a reasonable physical or social distance and just having this habit of regularly washing your hands with soap and water and keeping your hands away from your infected surfaces and not to take them to your mouth nose or the eyes and i think this was all about handling covid and as a doctor and as a person who has held so many responsibilities in the field of health right from my days in the medical college to being minister in the capital of india and at the national level and also having worked with the world health organization for number of years as an advisor to them i feel these small things that covid has brought about as changes in our life i think they are going to give rich dividends to the control program of many diseases it is certainly going to help us in the elimination of many of those diseases and these are some of the good habits that we will all actually should strive to develop for all eternal times as far as india is concerned although we all feel sorry about the loss of lives not only in india but all across the world but i can through you tell the whole world that india being a big country with a population of 1.38 billion people right now the whole world had apprehended lot of troubles for india during covid times people in many countries and in many prestigious institutions including us also experts also had predicted that by this time when i am talking to you in the month of july it was predicted that there may be something like 300 million cases in india and there may be something like 5 million mortalities in india this was all on record but i can now tell you with great pride that under the leadership of our dynamic prime minister a visionary leader shri narendra modi ji we were the probably the country where we responded first in the whole world the whole world knows that china had informed the who about the cases of covid on 7th of january and here in my office in the health ministry within less than 24 hours of that we had organized our first meeting of the technical experts within a week we had framed detailed advisories for the whole country you know it's a huge country with 35 36 states and union territories almost like small nations within our big country and different types of systems different types of people 
different cultures but within 7 to 10 days the whole country had started preparing with detailed advisories we had started point of entry surveillance at our airports seaports at our land borders and must have screened millions of passengers and people at these places we started our community surveillance very early and at any point of time there were a few lakh people under very active surveillance in the country we got our first case in the country on 30th of january but much before that we had established everything so that we had the detailed contact tracings and whatever needed to be done to strengthen our surveillance the very next day the prime minister had constituted a group of experts under my leadership with other ministers we must have held something like 19 meetings till now and throughout in the initial stages there were big challenges covid being a new virus there was challenge to train people there was challenge for the capacity building there was challenge to ensure that we have the highest standards and quality of surveillance in the community we must have done a capacity building of over 4 million people within the first few weeks and the whole world knows that we did a country wide lockdown under the leadership of our prime minister followed it with a lockdown 2 followed it with lockdown 3 followed it with lockdown 4 and then because the economy was being disturbed jobs were being lost unemployment was rising it was a very very tall order for a country as big as ours to take care of the millions of migrant workers to take care of their fooding lodging they were stranded all over the country there were people who were stranded in other countries we took all these challenges and started working on ensuring that we take care of these migrant workers we ship them to the right places a decision to unlock because we wanted to strike a balance between ensuring that we take care of the health issues also we take care of the covid issues also and we take care of the setback to economy it was a big decision that also our country took right now we are in the lockdown unlock phase 2 we faced a lot of challenges during this period but the country faced all of them very boldly for the world it may not be a believable thing but when we started our journey in our fight against covid we had only one lab in the country niv pune where we we could actually test for the presence of the virus but now when i am talking to you today from that journey of one lab to almost 
1250 labs all across the country that we have created it has been a huge task done with the support of the whole lot of health professionals our medical colleges our <coughs> prime institutions our corona warriors and today we are testing almost 3.3 lakh people every day and have an ambitious target of testing 1 million 1 million people in the next 10 to 12 weeks or so we ramped up our infrastructure and today it's almost 14 lakh dedicated beds created all over the country in our covid hospitals covid health facilities and also the covid care centers apart from this over 11000 quarantine centers with almost the same 11 lakhs or so the number of beds it's a total 25 lakh beds created all over the country with all sorts of support systems fortunately we are having only because of the fact that right from the day one we planned our strategy in such a way that we diagnose as early as possible to keep the mortality at the lowest possible level and today i feel happy in letting all of you know that today our recovery rate is also probably the highest in the whole world it ranges between 63 and 64 percent and our fatality rate is also probably the lowest in the whole world which is about 2.55 and still we are intending to bring it down to less than one percent this all has been possible because of the joint effort of all our health professionals all the departments of the government where it was a total government approach and it was a continuous blessings and the vision and the monitoring of our dear prime minister shri narendra modi ji that today in spite of being the second most populous country in the whole world with a population of 1.38 billion we have these data that i am talking to you we do not boast about them but i strongly feel that india with the support of its people with the support of its experts doctors paramedics scientists and all the administrators has done commendably well and it is not only the health sector but also our scientists are doing so well you mentioned about the vaccines right now in india there are roughly vaccine discovery activities happening at almost two dozen places and two of our vaccine candidates have already entered into the clinical human trial stages we hope and pray and wish that in the next couple of months we should get success on this front scientists are already working on discovery of new drugs repurposing of new drugs we have been able to produce most of these things which we were we were earlier importing whether it was the ppes 
or the N95 masks, or the ventilators, or the drugs. We have now come in a position where we can export many of them. The drugs, we were already, you know, whether it was the vaccine manufacturing capability or the capability for manufacturing drugs, we were already world leaders. We have been able to take care of the shock due to COVID and have worked in a very resolute manner. As far as the World Health Organization is concerned, the responsibility that has been assigned to me is a very decent one. The whole world is working together for the solidarity trials, whether for the drugs or the vaccines. And finally, I would say that as I have just narrated the story of how a billion and half Indians bravely fought the war against pandemic, I must simultaneously narrate a braver story of a resilient India currently fighting to revive country's economy. You'll all be happy to know that a developing nation like India is seeing a quick economic upturn. Like for the rest of the world, the pandemic caused a shock for the Indian economy as well. The four legs on which the Indian economy had been growing have all been impacted adversely. Number one, consumption because of the demand shock caused by lockdown and social distancing. Number two, manufacturing hit by large scale supply chain disruptions. Number three, exports, which are on a pause mode as global consumers also pause. And lastly, the capital flows hit as the pandemic causes risk aversion and emerging markets have felt the impact of capital outflows or slowdowns in capital inflows. With all this happening and much more, which you are all very, very conversant with, projections by international agencies were that we would be at one fifth the projected growth figures. It was then that our government led by our Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi ji started working on the plan to reboot and restart the economy in as smooth a manner as possible and as quickly as possible without diluting the healthcare and pandemic surveillance and management. Today our most important focus is on developing incentives for foreign investors. Through various policy changes, the government has managed to raise investor sentiment as well as attract the attention of foreign firms. For instance, India recently announced it is developing a land pool nearby, which is double the size of Luxembourg. Acquiring land for manufacturing has been a major holdup for foreign firms since multiple stakeholders are involved. Along with the promised land pool, certain states in India, such as Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, Haryana, and Rajasthan, have introduced labor reforms, providing incentives to new companies that set up their operations in their respective states. Further, our government is working on ease of doing business reforms especially to make registration of property easier, speedy disposal of commercial disputes, and a simpler tax regime. 
faced with this kind of unprecedented economic crisis post covid our government had three clear objectives number one providing enough money for emergent healthcare requirements protection so that domestic companies don't go insolvent jobs are not lost and also the poor and the vulnerable who are most impacted by lockdown and economic shocks get financial food and livelihood support as the lockdown progressed and now eases <coughs> the government's thrust has been to ensure that we provide financial packages to jump start the economy the rupees 20 lakh crore package was designed to restart the economy and business protect jobs and at the same time extend the support to those vulnerable and poor and the informal sectors with already announced packages and the liquidity that is available in the financial sector nobody will dispute today that the financial sector is in the strongest position it has ever been to help the economy restart especially msmes and agriculture we are working on ensuring that the over rupees 7 lakh crore of liquidity in the banking system should find its way to the borrowers and those corporates that need credit we got a spate of good news in the last one month as various foreign investors revealed their intent to set up base in india the technology giant google announced plans to invest 10 billion dollars over the next 5 to 7 years in india by way of equity investments partnerships and other arrangements to accelerate digitization in the country there are many other mnc giants that are now looking towards india huge challenges lie before us as we move on the path of rebooting the economy while dealing with the post covid trauma it is a time when the world has to collaborate that is the only way we can together reboot the world economy india has a unique tradition and culture which has always treated the world as a global village from times immemorial we look forward to the work world working on the same principle of collate and collaborate moving ahead so while our government is doing its best to improve demand restart businesses this uncertainty is the new normal the virus and the healthcare <coughs> risk are part of the new normal that we are living and operating in risk to both individual well being and business are not going away any time soon as long as there is no vaccine or a cure we don't know what tomorrow holds for all of us does anybody have any doubt that we are living in an era of uncertainty we need to be prudent in everything keeping the people together collaborating with the world and reducing the stress on nature these are the most responsible things to do as a nation and for all of us together the whole world must navigate these perilous and unprecedented times together many thanks for giving me this unique opportunity to address you all thanks once again dr hari Kipana Pali ji, thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harshvardhan. Thank you so much for your wonderful message and sharing a lot of insights and also the way you are uh, containing the COVID in India. I think you, we need to take more serious steps because the population is about 1.38 billion 
And also by 2027, it is projected that we're going to cross the population of China. So you need to take a lot of uh, uh, strategy in advance, uh, use technologies like probably genetic testing to profile the people so that you have the health profiles of the people and plan accordingly to allocate funding to see where the real need of the healthcare is and how do we take care of it. And I was very impressed uh, with how DRDO under the leadership of Dr. Satish Reddy built a thousand bedded hospital in New Delhi in a record 12 uh, days. I think those kind of uh, things needed in uh, other cities also, especially in Hyderabad, maybe Chennai, Mumbai. If you can look into that, that would be wonderful. I think it has a great opportunity now to turn this adversity into an opportunity because we have we are the youngest uh, workforce in the world we need to make sure that uh, sir kcr can you change the screen please so we we are the youngest workforce uh, average age of an indian working in the world will be about 29 years from now on and uh, our um, goal is to provide the right skills for them and also right training so that they can become responsible citizens and their health care is very much important to keep them healthy. So with this, I would like to thank you one more time for joining us today. And it's wonderful to see you and you take care and be safe from COVID-19 because you are needed for the country. And now as a World Health Organization Executive Board Chairman, you need to save the world as well. Please, please do the needful and uh, take care of the world and make sure that we have affordable quality health care to reach all the human beings on this planet in the next few years so that we can eliminate these kind of situations and reduce the mortality rate. Thank you so much, sir. Wonderful to see you again. And I would look forward to meeting you in Delhi when my next trip. And uh, thank you for meeting me in November. Uh, during uh, my visit to Delhi, in spite of your busy schedule, you made a stop in the hotel and we met and chatted for a few minutes. Thank you so much. May God bless you. I would like to sincerely appreciate Ms. Manoranjana Sin for coordinating your uh, address today. Uh, I'm very, very grateful to you both. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, I would like to uh, just um, take a moment to, Ziad, with your permission, we need to transition. Uh, the Prime Minister has to go to another meeting, so we would like to give you the next slot. So I would like to have um, our MC's Madhuri, please introduce the Prime Minister to speak next. Uh, how do we change the screen? Uh, KCR or Swami, somebody is on the screen, we need to change him. Please do that needful. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take care. Yes, thank you. So now put back to Prime Minister. Uh, Madhuri, please introduce Prime Minister. First, we have our keynote speaker, Dr. Louis Georgetin, who is the Prime Minister of the State of the African Diaspora, President of CRAN, the, Fr the French Black Coalition, and the founder of the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia. This day is now celebrated in more than 70 countries around the world. He holds a PhD in French literature and co-founded the first of many activist organizations while studying at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris. In 2014, Dr. Tin began to set up the African diaspora and give substance to the sixth region. Since then, with an international team, he has formed a government and launched development projects in all areas with the support of several African authorities, such as the Pan-African Council of Traditional and Customary Authorities. Now let's welcome Dr. Tin to deliver his keynote on the African diaspora, a resource for Africa. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I would like to thank uh, especially the organizers of this meeting. And I have also several friends in the room, like Mr. Kent. So welcome. Thank you, everybody. Yes, uh, of course, we need to speak about the pandemic, the, the COVID-19. Um, however, from a Pan-African perspective, we need to keep in mind that many other diseases are still going on. 
In the world, uh, 33 million of people have died of AIDS. Um, every year, um, 500,000 people die of malaria. That is exactly as many as the number of people who have died so far from COVID. And I'm not saying so to say that COVID is not important. I'm just saying so that many more people, especially in Africa, suffer from other diseases. And unfortunately, we didn't take enough care of these people and we didn't take any lessons from this situation. Had we been more careful about what's going on in the world, we would probably have been more careful about the situation. I would like to give you one example. It's very clear for whoever works in this area that a virus is not only a matter of biology, it's a social phenomenon. So the disease will not kill only some people, it will kill most of the time the poorest people, the most vulnerable people. And that is not a matter of nature. That is a matter of politics. Why did the VIH kill so many people in the world? In Europe, for example, people didn't want to take care of AIDS because they would say it's a disease for gays and black people, so we don't care. So they lost a lot of time, and when it reached to the global population, it was very late and too late for too many. In Africa, it was the same situation, but reversely. In Africa, people would say AIDS is only a disease for gay people. That means white people, so we don't care. Of course, that was stupid, but this stupidity, this politics of stupidity, killed millions of people who were straight anyway, or black. So I think we can say, of course, the same thing. The COVID, it's very clear that the people who are most affected are some kind of people, the most vulnerable, the people who cannot afford to stay at home. They cannot afford to do that because they need to work every day. And they need to work every day out of their home, not to die of starvation. So the threat for many people in Africa or any many people in the world is not the fact that they might die of COVID. It's the fact that they might die of starvation. So they need to go to work because at the end of the day, if there is no money, there is no food. So when you tell them you need to stay at home, and work from your home, they will tell you, well, I am in agriculture. How can I do that? We are seven or eight people in the same apartment. How can we organize social distancing? So it's obvious that there is a kind of bias, a political bias or a sociological bias. When you say to people, stay at home, you mean to the rich people, you can stay at home. When you say organize social distancing, it means if you are alone in your great apartment, you can organize social distancing. But for the poor people, social distancing is almost impossible. So some solutions are still possible, but we need to adapt them to the majority of the population. And in fact, most of the time, the people who take the decisions are not the people who are affected by the situation. So if the person who decides works in an office, has a great apartment, yes, you can truly say, stay at home, work from home. That's very convenient. I work from my home. I don't mind. But my people, I mean, 65 of the population in Africa works in the fields. So we need to understand that the solution that we have identified may work for some people and not for the other people who are the majority. So we need to find other solutions, whatever they are. For example, the state of the African diaspora 
one of the things we are doing at the moment is to create a huge program of telemedicine. Because the people, most of the time, if you tell them stay at home, then you need to bring medicine at home. So we are creating a telemedicine program. We are also, we have created a food bank initiative that is now in 15 countries in the world, from United States to Nigeria, through Panama, Italy. So the people are migrants, they are peasants, they are workers, but they need to eat. And sometimes it is an emergency. That's why we have created this initiative. Well, there are many things I could also mention. Um, but I want to say that, um, of course, the state of the African diaspora is quite concerned because our population is more exposed than any other one to the virus. So just to put it in a nutshell, I can just say that the state of the African diaspora was launched two years ago uh, during the Council of the Summit of the African Union. So we have a government, which I'm directing, I'm the prime minister. So we have a government, we have a parliament, we have 200 uh, members of parliament, we have ambassadors, we have citizens, we have programs of action in economy, health, education, we are building houses, cities, roads, hospitals, many things like that. Uh, with Mr. Kent, we are doing great things, but it's a bit secret for the moment, so I, will, I, don't, I don't want to tell too much about that. Uh, and I would be very happy also to be able to build partnership with any of you. You know, I think solidarity is the only solution. In nature, the animals that survive are not the animals that are the strongest. It is the animals that cooperate. In fact, the strongest are the ones who work together. When you are alone, you cannot be strong. If you are weak, but connected to everybody, then you are strong and you may survive. All people who work in biology know that very much. So in a time of pandemic, the only solution is to work together, not to think that only the richest may survive, we need everybody. India has to work with Africa. Europe needs to work with South America. The poor needs to work with the richest. This is the only way to survive and to perhaps to improve the world because now it is affected. It is revealing all the problems, but perhaps we can find better things for tomorrow out of this pandemic. So. I want to thank you. I'm going to stop here. I don't want to be too long. Uh, I'm sorry I have another meeting in South America, but I was very happy. Uh, my uh, IDs, my numbers, uh, my mail can also be shared with the people uh, around the, the table and are very open to any kind of partnership. So do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. I have one quick question for you, if you can answer. So I'm very impressed the way you organize this uh, state of the African diaspora and you have a ministry and you have parliamentarians in it. It's a wonderful concept. Hope other countries also extend to involve their uh, diaspora uh, living outside of their respective countries. It's a, it's a nice way to connect them. And especially the way you are doing the telemedicine and all are very impressive and hope you can pick up that agriculture sector also, what we discussed during uh, the launch of ADO in uh, Oslo, Norway in December. So thank you. I have one question. How is the state structured that you already answered and what are your achievements so far, if you can briefly summarize them uh, through the African diaspora? Yes, thank you very much. The first achievement is to create the structure. That means the constitution, the government, the parliament, the ambassadors, etc. Also, there is some content. Uh, so we have now an ID for the citizens of the state. We are recognized by several countries like Liberia, Somalia, or Haiti. We are waiting for more answers coming every day. Uh, we, are, uh, we have partnership with 50 kingdoms in Africa. So uh, many kingdoms in Benin, Congo, Nigeria, South Africa. So we have partnerships with them.
Uh, we have signed agreements also to build cities, um, especially in uh, Ethiopia, uh, Nigeria, Benin, for example. Uh, in Togo, we are building now a port in the city called Porto Seguro, which is about um, 10 kilometers from the capital. Um, so these are some examples of achievements. For example, uh, we have also managed to have a resolution voted in the European Parliament last year. And this resolution says that res um, European countries need to make restitution and reparation for Africa after slavery and colonization. And you can see that there is a whole movement in the world for reparation and restitution after slavery and colonization. So uh, after our lobbying efforts, we managed to have this law in the European Parliament. And now we are discussing with the EU about the modalities of the implementation of this resolution. So that is a matter of justice, human rights, culture, um, identity, etc. So that's some examples of the great things we are trying to do every day. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister, and I wish you all the best in this uh, very creative way to organize the diaspora and wish you all the best. Uh, stay safe uh, from COVID and uh, wish you all the best for your next meeting. Thank you so much for thank joining. Thank you very much, Excellency, for your invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hari. I just want to take a minute to highlight your background and experience before we move on to our next speaker. Dr. Hari Ipanapalli is a financial services professional, entrepreneur, and philanthropist with a passion for healthcare, education, and the environment. His mission has been to transform youth into responsible citizens to establish a peaceful society for harmonious living. He received his BTEC in mechanical engineering from JNTU Hyderabad a master's in computer science from New Jersey Institute of Technology, and completed an executive program in general management from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. With over 30 years of diverse experience, Dr. Ipanapalli has been involved in managing high visible global initiatives in the financial and social services sectors. He is an entrepreneur and investor in disruptive technology companies and serves as chairman of the board for the CIC Group and Quibble Gen Genomics Institute. He is also a keynote speaker and delivered over 25 keynote addresses during the last 15 months around the globe. His favorite subjects include future of digital economics, smart cities, and providing urban amenities in rural areas. He's a visionary mentor, founder and chairman of the Lead India and Liberty Foundation, advisor to alternate development organization in Norway, and the founding board member of the Financial Policy Council. He is extremely passionate about giving back to society. Thank you again, Dr. Hari Ipanapalli. Please introduce our next speaker as we move on to our next segment. Thank you. Thank you, Madhuri, for the graceful introduction. I appreciate it. Now, I would like to introduce Ziyad Ki Abdul Noor. He's the founder and chairman of the Financial Policy Council and CEO of Blockhawk Partners. Ziyad is a man that hasn't been afraid to get down in the trenches, which has garnered him a lot of skin in the game. He has used his warrior like capitalist mentality to catapult his way to the top. Over 30 years of experience on Wall Street, Ziad has backed over 125 companies and serial entrepreneurs that are now worth aggregate of over $30 billion. Noted as one of the 500 most influential CEOs in the world, Ziad holds a fountain of knowledge and invaluable information that he strives to share with the world. The best-selling author, and world-renowned wealth creator is on a mission to empower others to get their heads in the game, find their inner capitalist, and build the life of wealth and freedom that they deserve. His new release, Startup Saboteurs, breaks the mold and lays out the facts of what it really takes to gain back control of your life. This book is filled with pure, unadulterated truths and will be your go-to guide to navigate the challenging maze of egos, incompetence, and ignorance. Giving you the tools to separate fact from fiction, it teaches the core principles of abandoning limited thinking, eliminating boundaries, and how to stop defining the outcome to go out and become the big white shark and create your own wealth. With chapters on beating the startup odds, the rules of negotiation, and what venture capitalists 
won't tell you startup saboteur is the tell all book that entrepreneurs have been waiting for so it's an honor and privilege to introduce my colleague at the financial policy council and a good friend and always there when i reach him thank you ziad and i would like to welcome you to this august gathering to address the global webinar on the impact of global economy on healthcare education energy and how do we create employment the floor is yours ziad please you are on mute unmute yourself okay thank you harry for the invite uh, it's my pleasure to be here among such a distinguished group of uh, speakers people um i am not very uh, long on talk i'm short on talk and long on action so i'm going to tell you my straightforward opinion about what's happening today how do you regain your life how do you create wealth despite all odds the numbers are very bleak obviously in most cases they are factual that's for sure but this doesn't mean you have to uh, you know wait to see what's going to happen we're going through hell but as winston churchill always said if you're going through hell keep going that's the first way so when we talk about all these technologies which are very important as you mentioned and some previous speakers mentioned technologies don't hello technologies don't mean much if you don't have people executing on those technologies with the right attitude it's a question of attitude success is a question of attitude despite all odds and will the people who become really successful are the people who beat those odds not play victims whatever the situation is so right now if you look at it from a macro point of view we are at a crossroads freedom versus oppression growth versus stagnation shutting down the economy or basically opening it up against all odds while maintaining and dealing with while managing and dealing with the coronavirus capitalism versus socialism these are all the critical choices that will determine where we are headed in this century i choose capitalism i choose entrepreneurship i choose freedom that's a choice you make and when you make this choice then you go about it trying to see how you're going to manage through this maze despite coronavirus it's really easy to get bogged down in the political talk and the stats but that shouldn't scare you that should empower you to be the despite everything remember knowledge distinguishes humans from animals it's very simple more importantly knowledge is what gives us the ability to differentiate between what is right and what is wrong and knowledge is something that increases the more you share it i commend the prime minister who just spoke about bridging the gaps about working together but you know what what's more important we have to lift people up not scare them and bring them down i understand the coronavirus is no joke but it is going way overboard 
we can open up all the economy, be very careful, social distancing, all what we have learned. But there is no reason to ever shut down the economy. It is the lifeblood of all. Without the economy, you're not going to have any growth. You're going to have more people suffering from that, from the lack of an economy, than from the coronavirus. I'm an optimist. I believe in uh, human resiliency. People are resilient. From the kids to the older people, they're resilient. We've survived, humanity has survived a lot of things, and we're still going. This is not it, it's the end of the world. It is very tough, but it's not the end of the world. You've got to change your attitude, whether you're poor or you're rich. It doesn't matter. Everything you do in life is based on your attitude. I've done it. I came to this to the United States as an immigrant 30 years ago, and people told me, told me oh, don't forget about it, etc. I made it big time, despite all odds, because I don't break, I bend. And every one of us, if I did it, anyone can do it. Don't break, you can bend. The numbers are the numbers. Everybody has a political agenda. People say things depending on who's saying it. You have to be able to differentiate the wheat from the chaff, to do your due diligence, not to take everything for granted. Nobody necessarily wants your best interest. You're the only one who knows what your best interest is. Be smart about it. Don't take for granted some, some, uh, some personality, this cult of the personality. Nobody is God, everybody errs, we are all human beings. Don't be fooled, be smart. This is my message. My job, my mission is to lift people up and to create as many millionaires and billionaires as possible. Now, are you going to tell me, is it all about money? Of course it's all about money. What is it about? Fresh water? love and fresh water, of course it's all about money. Money is not about acquiring things. It's not about flaunting things. It's about freedom. When you have acquired enough money, you have the freedom to do and say and challenge whoever you want. You don't have to abide by your boss who's going to tell you, you cannot say this. Who the heck is he? Once you made it. You don't have to take all this from people. You give your opinion. You shape your life. You empower people. You inspire people. It, money is about freedom. And you know what? Everybody wants freedom. Everybody. Anywhere in the world, any color, creed, race, religion, they all want freedom. All the wars are about freedom, subjugation. This is what money is all about. And success is about empowering people, is not controlling people. A lot of the people think they have made it to the top because they control X number of people. No, it's about empowering people, billions of people in the world, making them think independently, look at things differently not be swayed with what Mr. X, I'm not going to mention names, who know, you know who they are, said or that guy said. Enough. Enough of this circus. This, is, may not, this may not be something you expected to hear here, but that's what it is. It's all about independence, freedom, success. That's what matters for every human being. For you, your family, your loved ones, your community, your country, your tribe, everything. And you know what? We don't have to all agree on everything. If two people, in my opinion, agree on everything, one of them is not needed. So the, 
diversity of opinion, of thoughts, is good, as long as it doesn't turn into violence. And there's nothing wrong in using force when dealing with violence. The world could not have stopped Adolf Hitler if they didn't use force. So, you know what, it's not like, you know, sometimes you used uh, overwhelming force, no. You know, these are basics in life, basics for success, basics for the human being, whether coronavirus or not. Coronavirus just came in this year. It created lots of havoc, but we're gonna have to deal with it. And these are the solutions. This is one of the solutions. You want solutions? The solutions is number one, change your attitude towards dealing with it and you'll be able to deal with it. That's pretty much what I have to say. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I cannot hear you. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Um, thank you okay. very much, Riyadh. It's a wonderful message, positive message, reinforcing that this is not the end of the world and we survived many pandemics and we will survive this one too. Having the yeah. positive attitude is the important factor that gives confidence and you can- I'm sorry, I can't hear you. That you have your mental condition. Can you Can you guys hear me? Now, now, now I can, before I couldn't, go ahead. Okay, again, again, I would like to thank you for joining us today. I have one question for the audience. Everybody wants to be successful. So I, I want to ask you, how do you define success in your terms? Success is about empowering people. It's not clipping people's wings. Unfortunately for a lot of people in this world, they think success being on the top is controlling your people, controlling a message, controlling a narrative. On the contrary. Success, you're gonna have to lift people up to think like you. They have to get to, to the top before you. You have to put them on your shoulders for them to get to the top. And you know what? If they all get to the top, they will all lift you up even higher without you even asking them to do that. You don't even have to ask them to do that. This is why I created my course and my book, Startup Saboteurs, which you can get on amazon.com, talks about that. How you build a company, how you scale a company, how you negotiate a deal. It's already in the, in the negotiation. How you exit a deal and how you create wealth. What are the things to do? What are the things to avoid? I'm not talking, I'm not a professor. I'm not an academic. These guys, frankly, I don't have much respect because they don't have skin in the game. They pontificate. They never know what risk is. They never took risk in the life. For me, I respect the entrepreneur capitalist who has skin in the game, who took risks and who did that. And this is what I explain in the book. I also created a course associated with the book to deal with these issues. Let me tell you one thing. Honestly, at this point in time, I have it all. The only, one I, the only thing I need is to empower as many people as possible to have this line of thinking to, to succeed, to help each other, and to stop scaring each other and controlling each other and trying to basically, excuse my friends, screw each other. This is no, there's no, it has to be a win-win for everybody, you know? I mean, because, because you can get value from everyone, from the guy who's more powerful than you and the guy who's, you know, but it's just a regular individual. Why don't you, you turn this regular into individual into a really producing, you know, well-oiled uh, money you. machine. Thank you. Thank you, Zia. That's a wonderful uh, message. So now I have um, um, one request I made to you to offer some discount. If somebody wants to buy this book, you offered uh, about 45% discount. Any of the organizations who are participating today, if they want to distribute their book, please contact me or Zia. Uh, we will offer you the discount. Yes, code. and by the way, I'd like to say uh, something. One last note, Harry. The proceeds of the book and the course are not going to me, are going to the Financial Policy Council, which Excellent. is a 501c3 nonprofit, Excellent. which is based on wealth creation. Thank you. Thank you wealth so much. Wealth creation is everything. Yes, thank you so much, Ziad. And we do Financial Policy Council, we promote the entrepreneurship and we connect Wall Street, Main Street, and Washington to legislate in a way to 
and encourage the entrepreneurship and we have events going on in new york city and now we probably need to switch to webinars because of the covid situation but we'll handle it and uh, we look forward to your participation in these conferences and webinars thank you ziad for a wonderful message one last question quickly i want you to answer money and capitalism is it good or evil because so many types of uh, systems are in the place in the market now money and capitalism is it okay good? well okay it's a good question uh, look there are different shades of capitalism capitalism is not one thing there is crony capitalism which is mostly prevailing today which is not working and there is capitalism there's two different things crony capitalism is uh, is very bad because it's abused constantly money is not bad you know money is not evil money is about freedom it depends who is using the money and for what purpose at the end of the day we come back to people to individuals we don't go back to technologies or commodities or money who is behind it and always even when you hear somebody talking about any topic just the first thing you check is not the veracity of the of the topic but who is saying it and what is his agenda because everyone has an agenda and when you start thinking like this you start assessing situations very differently thank you thank you thank you ziad good to see you and we look forward to working with you appreciate all the good work you're doing through financial policy council through block hack partners and through this book empowering many many youngsters who wants to be a successful entrepreneur thank you so much and have thank a thank you Harry. my pleasure and take care of yourself thank you mc is back to you Our next speaker is Bhavav Kant Upadhyay, a development leader known for his statesmanship, macro vision and pragmatism. A prolific out of the box thinker, he successfully established the India Japan Global Partnership initiative and is widely regarded as the architect of the modern India Japan relationship. This has led to mega initiatives like the Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor, which was formed to re-establish the industrial corridor of India. He is now focusing his efforts on establishing an alternative development model and forming a unique model of global strategic partnership led by India, Japan and Norway. Under this model, the collaborative strengths and resources of global partners are utilized to empower not just the development but the developing nations too. Mr. Upadhyay is the founding chairman of the Ultimate Alternative Development Organization in Ar- in Oslo, Norway, which is the headquarters of the ADM movement. The organization will take forward initiatives to establish ADM around the world. Let's welcome Mr. Upadhyay to speak about the alternative development model and how it is crucial in times like COVID-19. Um Vibha please unmute yourself, unmute. Yes, okay. go ahead. Namaste friends uh, my name is Vibhav Padhyay uh, thank you Sameer for introduction Dr Dr Hari thank you very much for inviting me at uh, this webinar and first of all i would like to say uh, pay my gratitude to my mentor my guru uh, Dr APJ Abdul Kalam uh, under whose leadership this uh, webinar is happening today with whose blessings 24 years back we at a uh, uh, organization called India Center in Tokyo we started this thought process of uh, uh, alternative development model and to achieve that uh, new development model in world the question was how do we drive it and why it is needed and i'm giving this background before i come to the point uh, why it is more important after covid-19 so the first question which came to our mind at that time what is the ruckus of the world why there are so many problems in the world and we all those friends which included some indian leaders japanese leaders other world leaders we were just discussing and and we we came to a very common thought process that you know all what you see around the world the war the the problems and uh, ideological conflicts uh this is because these are just symptoms you know these are not the root cause and let's get to the root cause what is the root cause so we 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 found in our researches and our thought processes that the root cause was in the 
design of the development model which we were following for 300 years or maybe more you know so there was a time when people in certain part of the world had a practices to was uh, which was successfully running. Uh, it changed hands so many times, you know, you know, like in 1945, the imperialism went down, uh, capitalism took over, then it had a cold war with the socialism, socialism uh, fought with uh, capitalism, and then European Union decided to use the hybrid of capitalism, social use, uh, socialism, you know, and then comes China, which decided to, to, to basically take a new experiment of capitalism with communism together. So in 1996, between 1996 and 2000, we, uh, we did this experiment of uh, Japan together as a global partner. We uh, exactly uh, in the same model what France and Germany did in the EU. And if we can come up with a, a framework of a new development model, which can, if accepted by masses and countries and regions, then we can potentially be able to do what France and Germany did. Uh, they brought an entire region of uh, Europe together. We had a potential to bring the entire Asia and, and Africa together. That was the vision. But the important is that the model has to be accepted and it should be working for all. So the major difference so it took us, uh, you know, five, six times to uh, five, six years to to come up with the partnership framework of India Japan when it was it was uh, announced, and then uh, after it was announced, the first model of based on this uh, uh, first initiatives based on this model were made in India, India being one sixth of humanity. We took this as a socio-economic framework, uh, a socio-economic uh, lab like like Africa. You know, so uh, there are uh, many initiatives were done. Now I'm coming to the uh, subject of uh, COVID-19 and why, what, why I think uh, world is looking for a change. You know, in a human life, it's like a perfume. You know, it has so much of uh, you know goodness and good experiences. Sometimes bad also, but so for us, this COVID-19 is like an a uh, coffee beans in a perfume shop, you know. You know, we're between one flavor of perfume to another flavor of perfume. So pre-COVID-19, we were going through a, a different type of life and a flavor of life. Definitely, this is not going to be the same after COVID-19. And what has happened in this period I think this was a uh, nature's warning where a scientist very well said, if human doesn't care about nature, if, if human does not take care of nature, nature will take care of them, you know? So this is a, this is a sign of warning uh, uh, to, uh, to the human societies. And we need to recognize, you know, we can survive it well if we can recognize and if we can really act upon that, what is this warning about? So my question to those strong nations and strong leaders and so so big bragging bragging leaders across the world talking about thousands of nukes and, and trillions of dollars in their bank, where are those? Where are those now? You know, why they are not able to stop Corona? Why they are not able to second day in two days uh, bring the vaccine or some medicine? Because every solution has a time period a process through which you can bring a solution. So the solution which is required for the human society now has to be scientific and structured and process driven for all the ruckus and toxicity it has created in last 300 to 400 years. And we have to recognize that, you know, we still are not understanding this. We still are trying to practice our friend China 
my 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 friends in China, I always tell them, there's no no harm in thinking large initiatives of development, but anything which you do through exploitation, is going to only create bigger problems and bigger uh, reaction from the human human beings. Look at Africa, you know. Look at many other developing nations, you know, how they have been exploited for last 300, 400 years, you know. And still, we are not able to come up with a new model. So my uh, appeal to, the, to this uh, esteemed gathering is that uh, the time has come when we should, uh, you, know, you know, hold hands together. Uh, our friend Zayt very well said that you know empowerment is the uh, is, is is a key word today. So the difference between the old development model and the new development model which we are proposing is that you know, the old one was always exploitation based majorly. I will not say the entire part of that, but majorly. But we have to now switch it to the majorly em empowerment based development model. At our foundation, we have been researching and uh, coming up with the initiatives. We have already done initiatives, which are several, I mean, which are now government to government initiative, but we catalyze it to happen. There are, you know, some of them are largest PPP models in the world, and they are different from the old way of uh, doing things. And they are gonna empower people in a different uh, way. So uh, uh, I would like to make a last comment on, based upon uh, COVID's experience. The first thing we should basically focus on, on evolving of, of alternative healthcare model. And healthcare model, if you, everybody will agree why we are facing this problem today is because the healthcare model was never been designed for masses. It was always uh, designed for need to base, you know. And it is very similar to like a car garage where when the car meets the accident, it goes to garage, it has been corrected and sent back. So it was basically made for the sick people and to repair the sick, sick people. It was never created to keep the society, society healthy. And with the alternative of this healthcare model, I would like uh, Dr. Hari and many of, of our colleagues here to, to join hands to, you know, we would like to uh, maybe in one of the web, webinars to bring that model which we are proposing to uh, WHO now and uh, our government also. Uh, and this will be very much a similar template of uh, Delhi Movement Industrial Corridor and other corridors made in India, uh, made in India and some, some of the initiatives we are doing in Africa. Uh, it's a same template of empowerment and then how we can reach to masses, how we can increase the portion of self-care versus the portion of healthcare. You know. If we can create a larger self-care infrastructure, which people can access at, at every level. And that's where I think uh, the healthcare will uh, you know, start changing. With this, uh, I thank you very much for uh, this opportunity uh, and this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Hari, and thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vibhav. It's uh, wonderful to see you, and thank you for joining from Japan. I agree with you fully, it should be empowered based economy, not exploitation. And I think we need to transition. Thank you for inviting me for the inaugural session to address the gathering of the alternate development organization in Oslo on December 11th. You created a very, very need of our organization. I think uh, we need to recruit more people, more countries to join this movement to make a difference we need to take all people along. It, it has to be an inclusive development, not just 1% or 2% of the development. Imagine if we could empower even 10% of the people throughout the world, we can see a big, big difference. And uh, ultimate goal is to preserve and protect this planet for future generations so that everybody can live happily on this planet and peacefully. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. We, we will look forward to working with you on this. And I think uh, this webinar proceedings should come up with a solid recommendation for various governments to implement and adapt and deregulate as much as possible and uh, use technology to empower everybody. Thank you so much. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Manuel Freer Garabal, a professor of pharmacology at the School of Medicine at the University of Santiago de Compostela.
He has a PhD in medicine and surgery and is the director of the SNL Lennart Levi Research Group, focused on the discovery of new drugs against cancer and infection, including new anti-SARS CoV-2 compounds. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine and IBNS, has authored over 100 articles and over 20 books, and has won 20 international and national awards. He is a member of several boards of advisors of the European Union and the Spanish scientific policy bodies. He is also the founder of the Compostela Group of Universities. Let's welcome Professor Garabal to deliver his keynote on higher education in the COVID-19 era. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, well, um, Honorable Dr. Bardam, Minister of uh, the Indian Government and WHO Chairman, uh, dear Chief Guest, Dr. Hare Hanapali, uh, dear colleagues, uh, keynote and distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor for me to be invited uh, by the lead Indian to participate in this exciting and prestigious webinar about the impact of COVID-19 on the global economy. The title of my presentation is uh, Higher Education in the uh, COVID-19 Era. Recently, uh, I wrote uh, an article uh, for a newspaper and the title was, uh, is this a global virus war? Well, I made a comparison between the, the Second World War and the uh, COVID-19 pandemics. Why? Because uh, uh, World War II was probably was probably the most uh, disastrous in the history. However, in the end, many people found an acceptable level of peace to continue with their lives. By contrast, uh, COVID-19 has uh, also devastating effects on uh, a global scale, but also made us uh, see previously invisible uh, threats around us that can provoke uh, unpredictable uh, changes in our future lives. As Pliny the Elder said uh, in the first century, in this situation, uh, the only certainty is just uncertainty. Because uh, COVID-19 uh, has uh, affected the direction of international policies, including higher education. In this moment, uh, we are challenging universities uh, to survive without the students and students uh, to survive without universities, at least in the way we previously knew. Um, as a consequence of the coronavirus uh, outbreak on the 30th of March, over 166 uh, countries have implemented nationwide uh, closures that uh, impacted over uh, 1.52 billion students, representing the 87% of the world students' population, and additionally, nearly 60 million teachers were no longer in the classrooms. So uh, this is really a high impact that was not found in any previous uh, global war. Also, uh, the economical crisis provoked by uh, coronavirus has big impact on higher education. Why? Because it's uh, reducing uh, employment opportunities for graduates, provokes delays in the students paying fees or just uh, the inability to pay tuition at all. Governments have also difficulties uh, in funding institutions at least to the decider level and even more Importantly, students are ch changing their preferences and expectations on education. For example, uh, a study made about McKinsey in the United States show that 15% uh, of United States students are likely to defer by at least uh, uh, the first semesters of the, new, the next academic course. 45% are very likely to look for a different school and about 83% expect a tuition discount if the campus is closed in 2021. So this is a crisis, but uh, we consider this is not a short-term crisis because we can't expect three different uh, epidemiological and public health scenarios 
depending on the pandemic control. In the first one, if in the case uh, the virus is contained in the next months, two, three months, we can predict a vital drop in the first year undergraduate enrollment. In the United States, about 15% uh, will have a 5% um, drop in their budgets. That represents $7 billion in revenues at the sector. And in the case uh, uh, the enrollment falls to the 20%, the amount will be $19 billion. Institutions uh, uh, at higher risk will be, of course, those with more high margin international students. For example, United Kingdom uh, international translations will represent at least 11 billion pounds losses for the next academic course. Um, pandemic also is affecting emerging economies uh, that offer uh, cost-effective education options to many students from low-income countries. So the problem is being really global. In the worst scenarios, in the case uh, virus recurs in the next months or there is a pandemic escalation, most uh, schools will be exclusively online since 2020. In that case, uh, first year students will lack of an on-campus orientation, travel uh, will be minimal, and the crowded events will not occur in 2021. And probably an essential share of the class of 2021 will not graduate. Um, in, the case, uh, in the case of uh, a pandemic escalation uh, scenario, uh, the percentage of uh, higher education institutions in the United States suffering more than a 5% a budgetary shortfalls will be the, the 50%. And uh, well, this is a really dramatic situation we have to manage and how we can do it. Well, decisions uh, will affect education methodology, students uh, experience uh, and organization levels. Teaching methodology will change to specific protocols uh, based on innovation. One of them, uh, I have uh, been attending uh, many uh, webinars and last one of this group uh, uh, mentioned it, is hybrid learning, which replaces part of the physical communication between the, uh, the students and instructors by the online connection. Unlike other concepts like uh, blended uh, or flipped education, Students are not merely watching a lecture. They have classrooms uh, that incorporate uh, interactive online virtual components. Which are the benefits of uh, incorporating online uh, uh, modules? Well, uh, the first one is that uh, we maintain one-on-one uh, -on -one interactions between instructors and students. It's more easy. We can't... Uh, use uh, interactive uh, virtual simulators, tools, and exercises that are not possible in the physical environment. We improve uh, cost efficiency. Online labs are cheaper to build and to maintain than physical ones. Flexibility, we not, do not depend on travel plans. Uh, more capacity for students in a group. Does, this does not depend on the number of classroom seats. Scalability, we can expand or decrease the number of virtual machines and resources very quickly. We can adapt uh, teaching or education to our agendas and accessibility. It only depends on the internet connection and not of the geographical location. Some people ask to me, well, but this limits uh, internationalization. It's not true. Uh, if we do it in multiple network environments, um, our aim, in my case, is to join the best minds in any discipline with the most suitable students worldwide in an affordable uh, way. We know uh, that uh, there are more resources for innovation outside our schools than inside them. And we know that uh, most of the smart professors are not in our headquarters. So uh, we can uh, put them in contact through the, through the net using hybrid learning together with, of course, uh, offline learning. 
A second aspect is that the students need to perceive the varied nature of the university experience. Therefore, uh, it will be necessary to replicate some aspects of the on-site education on the online environment. This will require creativity, planning, technology, webinars like this, and other uh, even more sophisticated activities can be helpful. Some authors uh, suggest to celebrate online uh, parties, uh, society events or ceremonies. Uh, that's a good idea and will provide some uh, uh, experiences in these times. And uh, finally, regarding the organization of institutions, uh, crisis management has to be centralized, but at the same time implemented at each level of the hierarchy and job families. We need to create uh, nerve centers to develop integrated responses for the different epidemiological scenarios, taking into account that volatility will become part of our new normal. Uh, pandemic economic disruption will cost between the nine to 33 trillion dollars, which represents several times the projected cost of preventing future pandemics. But even thought, authors estimate an expenditure of 70 to 120 billion dollars over the next two years and 20 to 40 billion dollars annually to reduce the probability of future pandemics significantly. So uh, this investment should be dedicated not only to the develop of new vaccines uh, and medicines and drugs, I am already involved in one of them, but also to promote uh, new health professionals and to provide continuous education for the existing ones. For this purpose, uh, uh, new technologies in education and uh, specifically hybrid learning will be essential. So, well, in summary, um, COVID-19 coronavirus has presented us uh, many, changes, many challenges. But although we cannot reverse uh, the damage that the disease has done and will do in the society in the future and uh, at a global level, that encompasses uh, much more than the purely sanitary, we shall try to learn lessons from this crisis and look for solutions to serve uh, to face future threats more efficiently. And uh, higher education in the health science will be one of the most important um, uh, aims to, to, to follow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Wonderful to see you from Spain. And uh, you highlighted a lot of things. The, um, uh, blended learning, uh, since it's a medicine, you need to have a lot of hands-on experience uh, for the students to undergo. So hopefully the virtual uh, reality kind of concept will bring uh, light into that area to bridge the gap. So one, one question I have, because of the COVID, um, how it's impacting, uh, my wife is a, a physician also, she is doing a lot of telemedicine. So how this digital medicine, it's like telemedicine, will take shape and what kind of changes we still need to improve uh, the telemedicine delivery? Mm -hmm. Undoubtedly, uh, virtual health uh, is a broad uh, term that encompasses uh, telehealth or telemedicine, among others, is a subject uh, in which I work intensively uh, to develop uh, new mobile and health applications and to design the new educational tools. Um, the use of telehealth uh, has uh, skyrocketed in the past few months, especially in, in the United States. Uh, health providers have scaled offerings uh, from uh, the 50 per, uh, um, from 50 to 175 times uh, in, uh, in the gap between the uh, end of 19 when the COVID uh, um, uh, appeared and uh, um, the 30th of March, more or less. And uh, telemedicine uh, in this moment has substituted between the, the 11% uh, at the end on, of uh, 2019 to the 40% in the months we have uh, spent in 2020. So, um, well, the isolation case by uh, COVID-19 made patients and their care professionals uh, to use this tool, but they realize that this is, uh, they have advantages on their daily life. So I am sure uh, this will be a good starting point for new developments in this area and in these specialities. 
So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Wonderful. Uh, we look forward to working with you and we need your help in uh, drafting these proceedings as well for the webinar so that the recommendations can be shared with World Health Organization and other countries and uh, institutions who are interested. Thank you so much. So uh, Vibhav, uh, I would like to bring you back uh, one more time because you also mentioned about uh, developing an alternate healthcare system through alternate development organization. So can you share uh, some of your thoughts on that, where you plan to implement uh, through alternate development organization, if you can? Yes, of course. Uh, well, I am involved uh, in uh, a project. I'm asking this question to Vibhav. Thank you very much. Uh, Vibhav, come back, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hari. So, Dr. Hari, uh, uh, currently, uh, we have the, uh, the roadmap, the blueprint ready. It took us seven years to come up with this model of alternative healthcare. And uh, we are in talks with the uh, government of uh, some state governments in India because it has to be implemented at the state level first, you know. You know, a, a all India or maybe all Africa will be very difficult to do it. And it's, it's uh, very interestingly uh, includes uh, components of blockchain as a technology. And uh, also it uh, includes a, a model which is like reverse of the current model. The pyramid is like, and the, uh, uh, very interestingly, the overall overall cost, if it is implemented, cost cost of the number of people covered by this new model will be bigger, and uh, the dilemma of the exchequers that who will pay the bill will be taken care of, and also uh, it will uh, basically uh, make the nations asset light. Mm -hmm. That means they don't have to make tens of thousands of hospitals. Uh, because uh, uh, a symbol of healthcare, you know, it will be a healthcare in a real sense where it will be incorporated uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, infrastructure of uh, self-care and more on knowledge base and more on, you know, so prevention, then prevention uh, is, 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 is the first line of defense, you know, right. and uh, so preventive health, uh, healthcare infrastructure, self-care, and then the healthcare and the healthcare infrastructure we have today in the world, not all the world, but in you know most of the world, is more than enough actually. If we if we if we analyze it, uh, uh, you know, in a different way. Thank you, hopefully, thank you, hopefully. thank you. I think uh, you mentioned the self care uh, will definitely uh, take care of a lot of things initially, and the preventive care next, and then finally. Uh, healthcare, that's where uh, the investment is needed in a different way using the technology. Maybe uh, I, I, I believe in having a genetic profile of every individual so that the government has the data to analyze and predict what are the next major focus the funding has to go into in preventive care. I think the, those are the kind of things I would like to work with you with the alternate development organization. Thank you we so have, much. Thank you. Just, yeah. We have a Japanese team, which is ready with an AI-based, blockchain-based, massive engine of healthcare, which can predict for coming 20 years, an individual, what is he going to face as in a possible uh, healthcare issue, you know? Excellent. I'd, I'd so, love to learn more about it uh, offline. Thank you so much, Vibhav. So since we, we are kind of getting late um, in, the, in terms of time, but I, I request sincerely the speakers uh, to limit to their... Uh, allocated time so that we can have a more uh, interaction with the audience uh, if, if we can save some time. Please, uh, MC, uh, go to the next speaker, please. Our next speaker today is Natalia Sokolova, the co-founder and managing partner of SGG World Single Family Office and Strategic Guidance Group. She's a trusted member and speaker of prestige at domestic and international family office networks and conferences. She has recently co-founded Skins GG, which is a health, wellness, and lifestyle platform for gamers to help manage various aspects of increased gaming activity due to COVID. Ms. Sokolova graduated from the University of Maryland with a bachelor's in finance and international business. Mm -hmm. Natalia is a member of the Russian Nobility Society, National Investor Relations Institute, and National Association of Professional Women. Now, let's welcome Natalia Sokolova to deliver her keynote on COVID-19's impact on health and wellness in the gaming community. 
Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate your everybody's participation and having me here as well. Absolutely, COVID-19 has absolutely changed the way, the way people live, how the companies operate their businesses. As a member of a single family office and a member of many family offices organization, it's very clear right now that a lot of families are looking for more non-traditional investments and charitable activities that are strategically aligned with the impact of COVID-19. Family offices, usual way of conducting business is very personal, intimate and face-to-face. -face. That's all changed now. And now they're forced to adapt to a very digital way of communicating. One industry that we're devoting more and more time right now, which is up very drastically since the quarantine started is the gaming industry. Since March, 2020, Gaming, online gaming has increased more than 75% according to Verizon. With education, meeting, conferences, moving online, the gaming industry is more important now than ever. With a community of uh, 2.8 billion people gaming daily, and with the global gaming market projected to reach 1.160 billion by the end of this year, it is a space that needs a lot of attention and structure. What COVID has created in this environment with people are largely at home, with no social events, with no physical jobs for majority of the population and government funding that's enabling people to actually receive more substitutes from staying at, by, and staying at home when they were actually working, if they have lost their job due to COVID. Also, if family lost their jobs due to COVID, they don't have to pay rent and are given a whole year to pay it back after the quarantine ends. I just read this week that about 30% of Americans' households are not paying their rent right now. As a result, the majority of population has a lot of free time. Social gatherings are being replaced by video conferencing and gaming sessions. What most people don't realize is that gamers are very social within their gaming communities. Majority of online sessions are played amongst other players rather than conducting solo. According to an Entertainment Software Association, 75% of American households have at least one gamer. That's 240 million Americans. Now their non-gamer family and members and friends are joining their gaming community. It is growing and becoming a significant part of the population that cannot be ignored. I would like to provide some interesting stats on gaming. The average age of a gamer is between 35 and 44 years old. 79% of gamers say game provide relaxation and a stress relief. There's about 46 million gamers that have disabilities. And 55% of parents say that they play video games with their children. You can see that from this data, that gaming is a force for good and is helping people to cope with stress, PTSD, disabilities, to bond with their children, to acquire new skills, new knowledge, and to socialize online, which is very important during the COVID outbreak. Gaming is helping the world population to deal with the situation coronavirus put us on so many different levels. Let's um, talk a little bit about education. For all online gaming, all online education is gamified. So now, right now, schools have a very tough decision to make whether on open or not. I mean, in the, what's currently going on, I'm in Los Angeles right now, and I don't see it very likely for the kids to physically go back to school next month. Uh, this means that education will be online through gamifying apps and video conferencing. Last year, over a thousand universities in the United States offered scholarship for gamers, academic scholarship for gamers. Many of universities have esports teams. They're early adopters. Many universities right now, including Harvard, Cal Berkeley, UCLA, Cambridge, all announced that they're not physically opening their doors for the school next year, it will be online only. That means that non-gamer students will be included in gaming community and will not by choice, but by necessity. <laughs> COVID forces education, entertainment, socializing to be online. Isolation, fear, security, loss of jobs create a lot of mental issues. And gaming has been proven to address mental health and to help with depression and PTSD. Many therapists are turning to games as a way to treat their patients. With VR, gaming even used to treat chronic and acute pain. 
On the other hand, increasing gaming activity also leads to health and wellness issues. Prolonged sitting session, uncomfortable chairs, lack of movements and time spent outside, sleep disorders, pain in the hands, wrists, shoulders, back, neck, vision problem, headaches, dizziness, you know, the list is pretty big. So with the world switching to digital life, we need to begin addressing these health concerns immediately. What we are doing to help address this problem is we're creating a centralized lifestyle and wellness platform for the gaming community that addresses the needs of gamers. Skins with a Z.gg is a name and a website for the company we're building. We'll have a portal for health practices, wellness education for gamers, offer supplements, topical creams to help gamers address their needs. And in August, in a few weeks, we'll add a free job portal to help gamers to connect with all employers seeking to hire gamers. It will be free for gamers and it will really help to, uh, for gamers to get the job they need in the space. It is estimated that demand for esports channels will create nearly 2 million jobs over the next five years. And the current HR hiring and staffing homes are very ill-equipped to service this emerging category. Gaming is a great way to empower people to change the current global situation. With many new companies entering gaming space, NGOs, light education organizations should take a closer look to the importance of the gaming industry in the current world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia. In a short notice, you joined us and surprisingly, I'm very shocked to learn that the average age is 35 to 44 and 46 million disabled people are using uh, some of the other type of uh, gaming and 55 percent of the parents are playing with their children it's it was very interesting yeah. statistics. No, no. And, uh, one more thing um, the gamification of education is definitely a way to go it will really engage them and because uh, it will give them the hands-on experience I think I would like to work with you on some of these things, uh, especially on the education field. So since um, the gamers are helping by staying home to prevent the spread of COVID, and uh, how do you think the vaccination will come into play and affect the gaming industry? That's a great question. Uh, first, I really don't anticipate that vaccination will be available for the masses this year. By then, the digital system implemented globally due to the COVID limitation will become a new norm. The system will be in place and the new habits will be formed. Many people will be well adapted to it and the gaming will continue to grow. One thing we also can ignore is the use of the mobile devices, smartphone gaming devices. Percentage of users who play mobile games will rise about 20% uh, by 2020. That's about 2 billion people worldwide, which is a very significant number. Additionally, like I just mentioned, you know, being a gamer is a proxy to ultimate shattering, sheltering is in a place. It keeps people entertained, they're not bored, they're not seeking physical form of socializing. And plus, you know, we see such things in Fortnite concert, the variety of entertainment options that can be initiated with this larger game at platforms are absolutely only limited by your imagination. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I wish you all the best in your Skinzy business. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. MCs, uh, take the, introduce the next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Mr. Eduardo Huerta Mercado, an international consultant, business executive, and entrepreneur with more than 200 projects developed in 25 countries in America, Europe, and Asia. He specializes in strategy, innovation, and entrepreneurship, knowledge management, public governance, and digital transformation. He has a master's in industrial engineering and operations research, a management of technology from the University of California at Berkeley, an executive master's in business administration from Purdue University, and completed the executive program in general management from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is the director at several consulting and technology firms in Latin America and in the U.S., and he's also an international consultant at the World Bank and the Inter-American Inter -American Development Bank. Now let's welcome Mr. Mercado to deliver his keynote on the impact of COVID-19 on the rising inequality in Latin America.
Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to participate in this very relevant event uh, with such uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, in the first place, I'd like to give a little background about Latin America. You know, the, it's comprised of 20 countries with a combined population of 650 million people and a GDP of about 5 trillion, which will make it like the third economy in the world. The uh, main languages are Spanish in most countries and, of course, Portuguese in Brazil. And there are three types of economic systems right now. There are open economies that pursue capitalist free free trade model like Peru, Colombia, Mexico, Chile. Uh, mixed economies that follow socialist policies like Brazil and Argentina and closed economies that follow Marxist policies like Cuba and Venezuela. To note, Latin America is a region with the highest levels of income inequality in the world. Uh, as you probably know, Latin America region has now become one of the hardest hit by COVID-19. We're like the epicenter of the pandemic right now. And at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, like all over the world, countries face two options, either prioritize health by imposing strict lockdowns or to lower the number of beds or focus on the economy and use less strict social distances measures to ease the economic shock. And Latin America has been unable to cope with neither of them, with very few exceptions like Costa Rica and Uruguay, which are very formal and typical countries. Uh, the region in general imposed the strictest lockdowns and yet deaths continue to rise and a gross domestic product has dropped sharply. For example, Peru is going to drop 18% this year. Uh, the reasons behind this situation lie in structural problems like high rates of informality, low quality and accessibility to public services, and low state capacity to deliver policies effectively. Levels of informality may reach up to 80% of the economy in some countries, which means that people in and informal businesses are not legally constituted and don't pay taxes. And even though they don't have access to credit and don't use the banking system, so the financial transactions are cash based. Although these problems have been prevalent for a long time, COVID-19 has exposed the high levels of inequality in the region and extended the gap between rich and poor. The difference now is that perceived inequality has turned real. Worldwide, the difference between uh, perceived and real inequality has been reduced by urban migration, globalization, and the explosion of the internet. Beforehand, many people were unaware of their lack of opportunities because they were isolated in rural areas. Quoting an, an old movie, uh, what happens is that you covet what you see in the internet. Uh, for example, in the region, uh, even though Chile has almost no poverty and can be considered a developed country by most measures, social unrest exploded last October after the government decreed a rise in the subject rates. But the real reason behind the protest was the difference in access to education, health, in a livable pension. Uh, before the crisis in Latin America, we knew that access to healthcare and education were much worse for the poorest sectors. And many people even made a living daily and had little savings. Uh, like many countries around the world, the pandemic caused the health system to collapse because there weren't enough beds in intensive care units at the beginning. On the education side, uh, the schools and universities closed in mid-March. Therefore, teaching had to be done remotely, which posed a critical issue because many households don't have internet access. In a family example, we sponsor UTK, United Technologies for Kids, which is an NGO that implements STEM education and social innovation programs, mainly in developing countries. As you know, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. Uh, so far, UTK has worked with more than 200 public and private schools in Peru, Colombia, Argentina, and South Africa inspiring and teaching thousands of kids who will become the future engineers and scientists that will lead their nation's development. Uh, our instructors come from top US science and engineering schools like MIT, Stanford, uh, UC Berkeley, and University of Michigan that team up with local instructors to teach the kids at schools. However, our programs were disrupted by the crisis. Uh, the government's original plan was to open in May, but as the lockdown was extended for the rest of the year, we had to migrate our delivery model fully online quickly. With the help of our partner, MIT J. Well World Education Lab, we developed in rush time the distance version. However, the main challenge we faced was that most of the kids who attend public schools don't have internet access at home. Some don't even have a TV set or a mobile phone, mostly in rural areas. There were, with the help of MIT, we created two versions, a synchronous version for urban private schools and an asynchronous version for urban public schools using TV sets and WhatsApp for mentoring purposes. The kids even receive a STEM kit at their home to replicate the lab experience they are lacking because they are not school anymore. Still, kids in rural areas have to listen to their class from the radio and are missing the whole academic year. 
this situation may have severe consequences for cognitive development uh, as adults and hamper access to opportunities. Uh, last year, I had the opportunity to work in Haiti, sponsored by the Inter-American Development Bank with James Robinson. You may know him. Uh, he's the co-author of that famous book, Why Nation Nations Fail. And we were talking about his theories, you know, that uh, where he explains that the tipping points in history that determine the path of economic and political development of countries and institutional change. And we are in, the, in that period like that right now, you know, where major transformation will take place as a result of the interaction of existing institutions and what he calls critical junctures. You know? Critical junctures are major events that disrupt existing political and economic balance in one or many societies, such as the Black Death, you know, which killed millions of people in Europe in the 14th century, or the Industrial Revolution. COVID-19 might be one of these critical junctures which determine how societies will move forward. In, in Latin America, real inequality has driven the rise of populist leaders in the region. You know? uh, because of the pandemic, thousands of people are experiencing loss of lives, jobs, and access to education. Authoritarian leaders from the left or right are already making promises to help the most hit sectors of the population with populist measures. You know that these actions will only make things worse in the future. Uh, there's the, for I believe that there are two ways forward post-COVID for Latin America. Uh, either political leaders decide that it's time to invest in their people and ensure access to public services and decent jobs, you know, creating more inclusive institutions, or the crisis will become a brewing pot for a social uprising and populism, leading to less democratic governments and maybe dictatorships, as has already happened in Venezuela. So people are experiencing loss of uh, we must take everything we are learning from this crisis and the breaches it has shown in our societies to be able to transcend it and ensure future sustainable progress in a world that is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous every day. As you all know, Harari, in his book, Omodeus quotes, knowledge that does not change behavior is useless, but knowledge that changes behavior quickly loses its relevance soon. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. Wonderful to see you. Thank you for inviting me to Peru to address the supply chain conference as a keynote speaker and arranging the trip to Machu Picchu. We had a wonderful time with my MIT professors. Wonderful. And uh, you mentioned some in interesting numbers. It's about 650 million people and uh, almost close to 6 trillion economy. But there's some political uh, instability in Latin America and it may probably impact how we recover from this COVID. Could you please um, how this political landscape will shift in the Latin American region, which can help the challenges we're going to face, uh, the inequalities in Latin America? Well, um, what is expected, you know, that this year, uh, the output levels of the region fall between minus 5 and minus 20 percent, and poverty levels will increase between 10 and 15 percent. So democratic institutions, more democratic countries, you know, free economies will be challenged, you know, by radical leaders from the left and right. You know, we have both in Latin America. Uh, in Brazil, we have a, a right wing, you know, radical leader. And in Venezuela, we have a, a, a left wing dictator. So current governments must answer quickly, you know, with uh, swift economic policies and effective communication be before problems take over. You know? Uh, I believe that governments uh, cannot cope by themselves with these issues. You know, I think wealth that is shared with all citizens is created by the private sector, by us. And I think we have must take a more active role, not only in defining, you know, helping the government define the socioeconomic policies, but directly contributing to, to the community's welfare. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Eduardo. We look forward to working with you and uh, your uh, work in the STEM education, educating the Latin American youth is amazing. I know that... Uh, you're associating with MIT, Stanford, and Harvard premier institutes to do that. Thank you so much. So we will go, we're running a little late, but uh, we will go to our next speaker, a dear friend of mine from New Jersey, Himanshu B. Patel. MCs, please introduce Himanshu. Our next speaker is Mr. Himanshu B. Patel, the founder and CEO of Triton Electric Vehicles and Triton Solar LLC, which currently has business in 11 countries. Mr. Patel possesses an in-depth understanding of IT, surveillance, and the solar products that support and maintain those systems. He has applied this vast experience to the renewable energy sector and specifically engineered solar technology, products, and software. Mr. Patel is keen to bring power to the rural areas of the world, as he believes all problems of the world start with power. 
Triton Solar is the only company in the world to provide hybrid solar panels that not only generate power, but also store it for use at a later time. His Triton electric vehicle prototype is expected to arrive in the U.S. on July 27th. Let's wish Mr. Patel all the success in this new venture and welcome him to deliver his keynote on energy storage and the importance of electric vehicles. Thank you, guys. So I would like to start with some of the important points about why energy is going to become a, um, a very key importance in this COVID-19. Um, as everybody might understand the, that there is a, a time frame in, in, in power time uh, that there is a peak power uh, between the hours of four and nine, which is usually when people come home from work, right? And then during COVID-19, we've been home 24 hours. So you can only imagine our power energy requirements are actually running on peak quite a bit. And we're running a lot more uh, unclean energy due to the fact that we're using so much power. That's one of the main components. And I believe that if we don't stabilize the grids, you know, you're going to have more people getting out during the COVID-19 and which will allow more people to spread the virus, right? So we need to make sure that certain countries have stabilized power for multiple purposes, right? For hospital purposes, for the purposes of the fact that if you want to keep people home, you know, they're going to need to have AC units. They're going to be running, you know, they're like somebody else mentioned the gaming systems. Um, so there's definitely power is like one of the main components that we need to look into and keep an eye on during epics like this, where the, the spikes happen and we're not geared to be ready for, you know, outages in those time of uh, timings. Um, we've also like to uh, talk about something that most people are not probably not aware of on this call, on this um, group today, is that we talk about electric vehicles and we talk about electric vehicles doing climate change and how it's uh, affecting the, the climate and it's changing the climate change. We have a different belief. Um, people have not understood that, that when you have as just an example, when you have 10,000 electric cars being plugged in at the same time, that's equal to one nuclear power plant. So as it is, we have a, a demand shortage um, of power in a lot of places, and especially at hours of nine and 4 p.m. and 9 a.m. at uh, 9 p.m. And so most people that have electric cars, they come home at uh, 4 p.m. and they plug their car in first thing. So now if you have 10,000 cars plugged in, that equals to one nuclear power plant requirement. So what do we, why do we have peak hours is because there's already a shortage of power. So that's why we call it that that's the time where we need the most amount of power. Um, and so uh, plugging in more electric cars doesn't really help us. We actually have to build more nuclear power plants and other resources of uh, power. So technically, yes, we're reducing climate change by not putting ammunition in the air. But on the other side, we're doing the same thing anyways, right? Where we're putting out nuclear waste in the uh, waters, or you know wherever the nuclear waste is going, and depending on the country. So, in our case, what we've done to address those issues um, currently, right now, just so everybody has a number, like Elon Musk has sold 360,000 cars. That equals to 36 nuclear power plants, which equals to 72 billion dollars in infrastructure that we would have to spend. And on top of that, we have to maintain the nuclear waste for more than 25 years, which would be extremely high and that still doesn't change the climate change, right? You're still doing the same thing that you're doing with the cars. So what we've done is we built our EV cars to have double the amount of power so that it can actually, when you come home, you plug in the car, it actually gives power to your home, not, not doesn't draw power. And it would charge the car back only after the hours of 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. when the, it's off peak, when there's excess power being wasted instead of wasting that power, you're charging your vehicles. That is the, more, that is the way you reduce 72, um, $72 billion of infrastructure and reduce the nuclear waste that is gonna go into our climate change. So we really believe that, you know, we've found a solution that can really change the way the, the, our infrastructure works. Of course, if there's a power outage, our vehicles will power your home. Uh, beyond just, you know, that it, it's uh, sending power during peak hours. Uh, it also actually generates your income because every day it's going to buy power during off-peak and use the power when there's peak hours. So those who don't know, but 
during peak hours, your cost of power could be anywhere between 11 to 40 cents, depending on which country you're in. And during off peak, you know, it can be all the way down to five cents to all the way to 10 cents, depending on, again, the country. So you can make dramatic amount of income while you're owning a vehicle that's electric. So it, it plays a multiple purpose. And um, we look to roll this out very soon. And um, currently, you know, we, we, we plan on uh, making this uh, a very strong, strong point to a lot of different countries. And even in the rural areas, we're going with rickshaws that can do the similar things. So it's not just only for the rich and wealthy people. We're doing it similar with, uh, you know, even the smallest people who can uh, drive rickshaws, who can generate more income and still be able to do the climate change at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Himanshu. I think uh, your innovation, I'm very impressed. I visited your plant a couple of times, especially um, charging your vehicles through off-peak hours and while they are sitting in the garage and powering the homes. It's a wonderful thing that your uh, new innovation will make a difference and save almost uh, $80 trillion uh, worth of uh, infrastructure related costs and you are doubling the capacity of your batteries on your cars and that means you drive close to thousand miles in one charge uh, i think it's interesting and that's the kind lovely. of yeah, contribution you're going to make to the environment is amazing that's what i'm personally interested in that was the dream of dr kalam to preserve and protect this planet for future generations i have one uh, question uh, for you so how, when do you think your EVs will hit the market and uh, what is your plan to, uh, to spread the, throughout the world because it's in need of the hour? So we have a vehicle coming in July 27th and then we have another vehicle uh, that'll be on the road testing during September. Uh, our first 100 vehicles gets delivered on August 2021. Uh, um, and then we start our mass production uh, starting December of this year. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. I know you have another important okay. meeting to run to, but wonderful to see you again. Look forward to meeting you. Same so, here, Harry. Thank you, guys. And you guys yeah. did a great job. Uh, this uh, particular segment to be completed, uh, the speakers, and next uh, segment to be jumping into is the valedictory keynote address by our uh, good friend, uh, Brian Patrick. Uh, MCs, please introduce the valedictory keynote. Our next speaker is Professor Brian Patrick Leaney, who has an international master's degree in communications, as well as a bachelor's degree in corporate management and in foreign trade management. He is certified in program management with APMG International and PMI. He's a board member and CEO of innovative technology driven companies in the digital workspace domain, food industry, natural resources and energy, and defense and advanced systems. He is secretary of the Sacred Military Constantinian Order of St. George and founder of the Initial Smile Token and investor in the economy of peace. He is also senior advisor to Lead Ventures, the office of H.H. Sheikh Sultan bin Abdullah Al Qasimi, and private partner to the office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. He is also the chairman of Reifenberg von Hastin Family Office. Let's welcome Professor Leaning to deliver his valedictory keynote address on the impact of COVID-19 on the economy of peace and the need for continuous investment into emerging countries and regions. Brian, you are on, yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> it's been great uh, to be here. Thank you, Dr. Harry, uh, dear distinguished panel, uh, dear participants and viewers, I'm happy to be here. It's my great honor and pleasure to be invited to such a uh, fantastic uh, webinar today on the impact of COVID-19 and the future of the global economy and employment. I'm representing today uh, or talking from our family office and like for almost everyone else, uh, the impact of COVID-19 is one of the main subjects in recent time. Therefore, we'd like to discuss its impact on what we refer to as the economy of peace and the need for continuous investments into emerging countries and regions. We invest in the nexus of vital industries. So <clears throat> what are vital industries? For us are industries connected to food, food security, water, water security, energy power provisioning, uh, healthcare, which is also medical, um, education at large, uh, recently very much into the online world as well, uh, finance and finance structures, including also all of the blockchain and crypto, 
and national security um, because of its direct connection, in fact, to empowerment of people, employment and this prosperity of people. Um, these are not all sheer altruistic, to be honest, you know, um, but the economy of peace is the largest economy on earth and in, in its connection, you know, everything is intertwined. Without power, no desalination of water. Without power, no lights to learn at night or to go about and go to your factories. Without any kind of security, um, nowadays, we find that um, regulations and stuff are not easily uh, maintained. Healthcare, because people need to be in good health to work, to be happy, to learn, you know, to go to work. Food security, food safety is essential to anyone. If you don't have anything to eat, the world will look very grim to you and you will start doing other things to get to food. Food is very essential, the same for water. What we wouldn't do for a glass of water if you're dying from thirst. The economy of peace to us is very predictable because it stretches out over so many industries and sectors. Therefore, reducing the risk while creating a proven constant reward is one of the reasons to invest at large in several industries and sectors. COVID-19 particularly, well, did not have and does not have a negative impact on funds nor on our investments. This might come to a strike for those who don't know. But at the same time, you know, COVID-19, once I heard it once said to me that never let a good crisis go to waste. This is very opportunistic. It might be, you know, the view of someone who's in capitalism very much. But in fact, it is true. COVID has a seldom seen impact on the global economy and therefore on the industrial and financial landscape. At the same time, we see crypto coming about, opening doors where they were shut involving people into the financial and economic system where they were left behind now. COVID-19 not only caused businesses to go out of business, but also provoked the digital transformation to happen much more quickly and overnight. How long would we have waited for everyone to go on a webinar or partake in all kinds of, well, gamification or sorts? It would have lasted maybe another 10 to 15 years. So this crisis also has this positive upside and is bringing us closer together. COVID-19 gemmed, however, the global agenda, which included such topics as global warming, poverty, and impact investment. Well, more to the latter, but, you know, <clears throat> we were very occupied until, let's say, January, February with global warming. It was the only topic we spoke about. And at the same time, for global warming, we, in fact, were not really um, valuing the topic as such. We were more on, on propaganda, and then I'll speak very liberally about it. Um, but now with COVID-19, we see there's more to it, right? So it's still about global warming, but what can we do with digitalization and with new industries, in fact, to really make that happen as well, so that we have a better Earth tomorrow? COVID-19 in increased international and national threat levels, closing not only physical borders, but also economic borders as well. Well, from our perspective, there's no need to that, right? The economy is needed, businesses are needed. We need to work, we need to make a living, right? To shut everything down is, yes, maybe for now, a measure to take and a very good one. We'll see in years. It's not, it's very, it's too short to answer that question really now. But one thing we know, if you don't have any money, you will not be happy. If you don't have any money, how to spend it on your health. Even if you wear face masks, if you're not given to, the, to you, how are you gonna buy them? How are you gonna buy all of these, you know, lotions and whatever sprays that will keep you safe? If you don't have the money, you're left out. So money is important and it's important to make your business. COVID-19 did not affect the total amount of investments, nor the availability of money, nor of investment capital. We only recognize the shift. It is time of opportunity and not one to act upon fear. Fear is never a good guidance in all of the situations. So 
Continuous investments into the developing countries and regions is essential to empower people, young men, young women, creating their own livelihood and independence, but also those who are 50 or older who see new chances based upon their experience. Upcoming high potential countries, as I call them, instead of developing, I really like that, high potential countries, have a key position in the economy of peace. Every nation now that it has been you know, on the backdraft or, or been left out uh, of global economy at large has now a chance to partake. You don't have to alter or transform what you already have in place. You can start anew. You can start from scratch, which is a huge advantage in today's arena. However, we are aware that young people who studied in their own countries and then left the country, for example, people from India or wherever, used to migrate to other countries to work. We have to create the jobs in the, in the country specifically and to remain or keep the youngsters working there or the diaspora to go back to the nations and help the nations build up very quickly. There's a chance. We, don't, we do know the mass migrations are to be avoided. Mass migrations are caused for once by poverty, by need. So we have to solve that need. And that's a great opportunity as well. Everybody will uh, partake in this, this true global economy, as I say. Social demographics of emerging countries or these high potential countries and regions back for a solution to support the young families building a sustainable livelihood. It is very simple. Once you're not depending on anyone to give you anything, you will have a better chance of being happy. Of course, we know all of the other things that come about, but at least you won't worry about feeding yourself or giving your ch children an education. Employment, therefore, is crucial on so many levels and a key element for stability and safety. Because having an employment, a job, is so much more than having, having that job, right? It builds your character. It builds your confidence. It gives you trust in the future. It makes you dare things. Having a steady income to most humans now is the highest achievable goal. So there's no room for self-development. Employment keeps the people of the street as well, improving security. Therefore, it is very important to invest in this future of global healthcare, education, energy, and the other sectors I mentioned. We are getting closer to a true global economy where there's great opportunity for people around the globe. New technologies, mobile communications, and financial systems make that better possible, allowing those who were excluded from even a bank account to now become part of that financial ecosystem and swiftly improving their empowerment, and certainly in those high potential regions. It is more than doing great business. It is our responsibility to invest into global and local societies to create affordable healthcare, affordable education, affordable energy, and for most also affordable, nutritious and healthy food. There's nothing worse than seeing people go out every single day trying to make a living for the family and not being able to. Or what they bring home as food is poisoned or not ready to consume. This is very dire and I, you know, it strikes me to the bone every time. And this is what we do as a family office. This is our main goal to uh, improve that empowerment. Invest, investing into this economy of peace brings great happiness and fortune to everyone. And from my personal perspective, it may be the only thing that is worth our energy and time of those who can. Even on a lower personal level, everyone is responsible for contributing as much as they can. A person I hold very dear always tells me, Brian is not a sprint race, it's a marathon. And I do agree, but if you don't keep going, you will never get anywhere. As Benjamin Franklin said, God does not give money. He gives the power to get wealth. And fortune favors the prepared mind. And this is the one thing. If we can get people ready, if we can educate them and give them some money in the pocket or the ability, not give money, but ability to, to earn money, 
we create a better world, and then we also find solutions where COVID has no threat to. And this is my valedictory keynote speech, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brian. It's a wonderful message. I strongly believe in your principles, empowering people to end their living respectfully while keeping them healthy, educated, and have their nutritious meal on a daily basis. I think uh, you are uh, doing a great service to the humanity through your family office. I have one question. I also strongly believe in this digital transformation I stopped during my opening remarks. Uh, te technology has to play a big role in this inclusive economic and socioeconomic development in the world. A lot of uh, people are left out out of this 7.8 billion people. Only several billion people are uh, empowered, but the rest of them are not. I imagine yes. if we empower everybody else, the world will be much better world. Everybody will be happy. They don't want to depend on anybody to support them. They want to end their living on their own. Correct. We can do that. How do you think this digital transformation will create employment in the emerging countries? Uh, I like the word you were uh, high potential countries. Yes. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, I believe that People in emerging countries have, have great ambition, right? And, and take pride in their success. Very much more than, let's say, in, in, in most European countries, right? We don't share success as, as people do in uh, high potential countries. We, if you are successful or, you know, to any extent in, in let's say, a, a high potential country, you like to share it with your family, you like to share it with your friends. People will be happy for your success and they will copy and try to do what you do. And this is a thing that we, we not so much see, let's say, in, in the Western world. Um, like like this, uh, our fellow Zayed said, it is about attitude, right? Having the, the right attitude. And if you're hungry, and then you also have little to lose, and there's everything to go. And this is something amazing. Being in need is not your end. It's just your start. It's your beginning, right? You have everything to go for. And now with digital transformation in the fourth economy, right? Or the, the uh, fourth digital revolution, technology makes a lot more available, right? Especially in education. Um, but technology makes it also low tech. It's not all about high tech, also low tech. If we can create and be creative, we can create low tech. And low tech already can play a huge part in agriculture, right? To cultivate better to grow your crops better, to more, be more in control. A little bit of internet can help anyone achieve a lot. So that's why I think that those who can, who are empowered or in power, have a, have a great opportunity to invest in those rural com communities and those high potential areas. Thank you. Because the people will Thank appreciate it. Sure, definitely. There's a one more thing. Uh, because of the COVID, it impacted really the liquidity, a lot of people are unemployed and most of them are on a daily wage earners. Um, if they want to re-engineer themselves to have a better life, they want to get into new businesses. The capital may be available for bigger corporations, but how about uh, the micro credits and small businesses during this time? They are struggling. How do we fund those people to enable them to bring back their life to normal? Well, to us, you know, we can invest, let's say, one million into one business. Or we can support 2,000 businesses, right, with a smaller amount. The thing is that for microcredits and microfinances, you can do a lot. And, and a lot of people, or most people, don't need a lot of money to achieve success, right, to, to have that increase of their income. And this is very important. The world survives on small businesses, not on large, larger corporations. We always look at the big ones, right? But count the number of people who work in the small companies, right? Far more, far more than in those global companies, right? And of course, they're leading and, and, and we supply to them from a small uh, company background. But still, you know, if we can support small businesses, family businesses, just starting, taking a chance because, you know, if I lose $5,000, for instance, right, I won't eat anything less. I won't drink a cup less. I won't, I will still do my stuff, right? But to some other people, $5,000 may change their life forever. So, and I believe that microcredits, uh, microloans can do a lot, you know, and 
even with COVID, we can tell them, you know, pay in three years, right? We don't have to have a 7%, 8%, 12%, 16% um, revenue on the loan. It's insane, right? So it's better to, to be a partner than to be a lender. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. I think I'm very fortunate to have connected with you. So with your kind of mindset, we could make a difference in many lives on the planet uh, because they're all suffering and not sure uh, how long this COVID will continue. I think if we need to give them the confidence that, yes, we can fund you and we could bring your life back to yes. normal. I think I will, I'll work with you on this because I'm very much uh, keen on enabling people to end their living respectfully rather than depending on the government entitlements. Government yes, also it's about solidarity right now. Their revenues went down. Governments cannot support either. So people have to self-empowered to do yes. as we said. Uh, self-help is the best thing to do. And we need to find a way to uh, use the technology to educate and empower them. I think uh, it's a wonderful thing. And thank you for having Thank you so much. For, uh, uh, this long uh, to deliver your uh, valedictory keynote. Uh, wonderful. So now I would like to switch back to a uh, couple of uh, thank you notes to all the people who helped us in this. One second, let me share the screen for a minute. So I think uh, we got the person of uh, this crisis, um, uh, the chairman of the World Health Organization, uh, Dr. Harshavardhan joining us, truly, truly made a difference to us today. His message and is uh, giving the confidence to the people that he is there to address this COVID-19, not just in India, but as a chairman of the executive board of uh, World Health Organization. I'm looking forward to his leadership to make a difference and hopefully this vaccine will come soon. Uh, Dr. Harshavadhan, again, I gratefully appreciate your time and in participating in this webinar and addressing the global view. I was getting messages that about uh, over a million people watching this uh, show. Uh, and I would like to thank all the speakers, uh, Ziyad, uh, from your busy schedule joining us today and uh, delivering your um, inaugural keynote and prime minister, in spite of your uh, busy schedule and several conflicting meetings, you made time for us and talked about the African diaspora and its role. Brian, I really, really sincerely thank you for uh, stepping up through your family office to help people to earn their living respectfully. Vibo, I look forward to your leadership, uh, especially through alternate development model. It is the need of the hour. We need to change the way we take care of the people of the health and their education and empowering them to earn their living. It has to be an inclusive, development, not just tailored to certain people only. I think I really appreciate you joining us today. Professor Manuel, truly you are the kind of person I want to work with because uh, you are closely connected with the education, especially in the medical education. So it, it solves two issues, healthcare and education from our Lead India mission. And I look forward to associating with you. And thank you so much for joining today. Natalie, you gave me a lot of uh, surprising uh, statistics. Uh, interestingly, the percentages are very uh, big and they are truly helping to contain the COVID spread because this gaming population is staying home. I think if you could somehow come up with this uh, gaming gamification of education, that's where my interest is. So hopefully we will cross our uh, uh, each other and uh, get to know more to see how your gamification can help uh, to educate the world. Eduardo, I uh, think Latin America needs your kind of uh, vision and mission that you want to transform the way the kids are educated by engaging all these uh, premier institutes like MIT, Stanford, Yale. So I look forward to working with you and you already invited me to Peru once and it's a wonderful to see you again. Himanshu, you are the game changer and you are coming up with this innovative technology to place a car, not just to drive on the roads, but to energize the homes and the world. And at the same time, reduce the amount of uh, investments needed 
in the energy sector. You, you talked about almost $80 trillion. It's a big number. Uh, and I uh, wish you all the best and look forward to working with you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be on your advisory board. So it's, it's uh, very kind of you and uh, wish you all the best. So the next, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, my media partners, especially the TV5 um, and uh, Mana TV, KCR and Sridhar Chillara CEO. They've been very helpful in uh, setting up this uh, webinars and helping us with the broadcast and providing us the raw link to so that the video can be played in many other uh, channels. Our um, other media partners, TV Asia, Srinivas Ganagoni, I would like to thank you personally, GNN, NRI, GKTV, Janam Sakshi, Radio Aid, Free Express, Navateja TV, Voice Today, V5, Top Telugu, BCN News, all these channels broadcasted their viewers. Each of them have got a couple of millions and uh, majority of them are tuned in. I'm getting the reports. So it will, it may be a more than a million people watch your show today. Thank you, all the speakers. And I would like to thank all the supporting organizations, the CIC Group, Al Khalifa Business School, Alternate Development Organization, Digiton, Triton, Electric Vehicles, Telangana Youth, organization and the World Environment Organization, SGG and NIRAWALA. So I would like to thank you all for making this possible. I would like to thank our MCs, Madhuri Guje, Samir Ipanapali and Vaishnavi Chipa. Let's have a big round of applause to these people. They worked very hard for the last couple of weeks in compiling and managing this uh, final show today. Thank you so much. So would like to again, let you know that uh, we have uh, an event coming up on uh, Ravi Garu. Okay, so we would like to announce that on July 27th, uh, it is the fifth anniversary of our mentor, uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam. And our uh, event is, uh, the topic is going to be on the rural mm -hmm. economy. How do we revive the rural economy? So I'd like to, see some of you recommend um, some how uh, way to revive the rural economy, especially in India, there are a lot of migrant uh, people left with the, without any jobs and uh, they are struggling. So we need to find ways. I think uh, the ideas that Brian has provided, probably we can take some inputs from there. And the government of India, a lot of people are participating in that webinar. So we look forward to having you attend that webinar as well. It's on July 27th, same time. Uh, we will, uh, governor of the state of Andhra Pradesh and uh, the chairman of the DRDO, Dr. Satish Reddy is going to deliver the keynote address as well. He's the one man built uh, a thousand bedded hospital in New Delhi in record 12 days. And uh, he's a rocket scientist. Uh, and a big uh, follower of Dr. Kalam. He will be joining us on that day. Again, I would like to thank everybody. Uh, our uh, team, technical team, I would like to thank uh, uh, Raju Neta, who did all the social media campaigning, and uh, Dr. Ram uh, Maruri from Hyderabad, who did all the registrations and followed up. And we have Srinivas Komadpalli, who took care of our website. Then we have Srinivas Guduru who helped us in coming up with this uh, program and helping us design the flyer and other things. Then we have a lot of other youngsters on different countries um, helped us in coordinating with the uh, various TV networks and also to the local organizations to enable them to watch this program. So Dr. Ravi Ayagari, who's sitting in Delhi, uh, who joined us also, he is instrumental in helping us with the technology part of uh, today's program. Thank you, Dr. Ravi Garu. So I think uh, if I missed anybody, uh, I would like to take the responsibility on the shortcomings and all the good things happened goes to my team. Uh, this is how Dr. Kalam taught me. As a leader, I need to take the responsibility for any shortcomings. And the program went beyond what we expected. But uh, it's worth listening to all these eminent speakers from all over the world. I think uh, this is one of the sessions I personally enjoyed seeing all of you. I personally selected uh, you, one from Japan, Vibhav, 
thank you for joining and uh, Eduardo from Latin America and Brian and uh, Professor Manuel from the Europe. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Harshavardhan uh, representing the World Health Organizations from India and uh, Ziad uh, and Natalie from the Wall Street. And then we have uh, Himanshu from the energy world. I think it is a very, very select group of eminent speakers and you provided a lot of insight. And I would like to request all the speakers to participate. Uh, I will create um, a task force to compile the proceedings. And I would like to, I spoke to Professor Manuel before, but uh, he will be leading this effort of gathering the inputs from you to compile the uh, proceedings of this webinar so that we could circulate to various governments and interested uh, civil societies and nonprofit organizations who can take this message forward. There's a lot of valuable information being, uh, presented here in this conference and we want to put to use some of these things where there is a need because everybody is struggling and they are in panic condition and this kind of confidence giving moral boosting uh, webinar with a lot of practical approach to reviving the economy and uh, providing the affordable quality health care, providing affordable quality education, providing affordable quality energy and mm -hmm. also kickstarting this economy so that people can get to work wherever they are, possibly from their uh, homes, if they can start working and end their living respectfully. Again, from my uh, entire team, I would like to thank all of you and look forward to working with you. And wherever you are, be careful, stay safe because you are needed to keep others safely. So this COVID is going to stay with us for some more time. We need to learn to live with it. If not COVID, we may have something else. So I think this gave us a big lesson how to survive on this planet and we survived in the past and we will continue to survive with your positive and encouraging attitude and guidance. I think we will survive. So I would like to wish you all the best and wish you a safe and healthy life ahead and success in your every endeavor that you do in your life and I will work with you personally one-on-one. -on -one. If, if I can be of any help to you, please feel free to reach me anytime. I'll make time for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. for giving Thank this you opportunity. Much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Arigaru. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Good night. Good night.